Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for being here for the Beaver Watershed Alliance quarterly speaker series. Today's topic is septic efforts in the Beaver Lake watershed, and we have Shelly Smith, program manager for H2 Ozarks, joining us. Um, but before we um, before we hear from Shelly, uh, we'd like to share a little bit about the Beaver Watershed Alliance. So our mission is to proactively protect, enhance, and sustain water quality in Beaver Lake and the integrity of its watershed. And we do that through education and outreach, technical assistance to landowners and communities, and planning and analysis activities. And for those of you who may not be familiar, uh, the Beaver Lake watershed is in the headwaters of the White River system. So the Beaver Lake shown here at the, um, the headwater area of the White River, it flows into Table Rock Lake, Bull Shoals, and then on over um, across Arkansas down to the Mississippi River. And the Alliance is really focused on the sub-watershed areas draining to Beaver Lake. So um, if you kind of zoom in even further to some of these smaller watershed areas like the West Fork, Middle Fork, East Fork, um, headwater areas, Richland Creek, War Eagle, and the areas directly around Beaver Lake. Um, those are mostly the areas that the Alliance is focusing on to reduce sediment and nutrients going into Beaver Lake. Now there are four main water intakes for water supplies on the lake itself. And this water supplies over half a million people fresh drinking water um, in Arkansas. So the Alliance is working with partners and landowners to um, implement and research solutions um, to improve and protect water quality. So things like low impact development, um, agricultural practices, um, invasive species removals, creek cleanups, forestry management, streamside management, um, and septic efforts. These are all kind of part of this toolbox to um, help solve and improve water quality issues. And, <clears throat> you know, we see this as you can't do this alone. We, we need to rely on great partners to help achieve these things. So here's just a, a kind of snapshot of some partners that we work with here in Northwest Arkansas. Um, and we continue to grow these partnerships and um, we're just so honored to have the opportunity to work with groups like H2 Ozarks um, to do programs like these that are helping landowners on the ground. So if you'd like to uh, contact the Alliance, here's our information. You can email us, call us. We have a website that was recently updated. Our offices are in Elkins, Arkansas on the White River. Um, social medias, we have a podcast, there's several ways to connect with us. We encourage you uh, to do so. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and introduce um, Shelly Smith, our guest speaker today. So Shelly is the program manager for the septic remediation program administered by H2 Ozarks. Shelly works to spread septic education and awareness across the region and is thrilled to be assisting homeowners reduce environmental impacts with this program. Um, when she's not traveling across the beautiful Beaver Reservoir watershed uh, to connect with homeowners, Shelly and her family can be found recreating on the rivers, especially the White River, the Kings River, and the Buffalo River. So Shelly, we're so happy to have you here today. Thank you, and I will turn it over to you. Okay, perfect. So good afternoon, I'm really excited um, to be sharing with you all about our really exciting program um, doing septic remediation. So I am the program manager for the septic remediation program. I work for a nonprofit organization called H2 Ozarks. You might've known us formerly as Ozarks Water Walk. Um, we are uh, an organization that aims to protect and improve water quality in um, the lakes and watershed area of the Upper White River Basin, which includes Beaver Lake, as well as Table Rock Lake, um, Bull Shoals Lake, and Lake Taney Como. 
as well as all of the other streams and rivers and waterways um, across the Ozarks. So, um, uh oh, we're not advancing. There we go. Uh, our program in a nutshell um, is a pilot program. Uh, our grant period is a three-year period started last year in 2021, and we will go through the end of 2023. Um, our program provides technical and financial assistance to homeowners that reside in the um, Huckate Beaver Reservoir watershed, which you can see on this map, um, is quite a large area, covers uh, parts of Washington County and Benton County, um, all of Carroll County, majority of Madison County, and then parts of Franklin, Boone, and Newton counties as well. Um, so we provide assistance to homeowners to address failing septic systems within this geographic area. And our program eligibility is quite simple. Um, you have to reside, the homeowner that we're working with has to reside in the watershed and your septic must be deemed failing by the um, Arkansas Department of Health. So um, to just briefly explain uh, where our program came from and how it came to be, uh, the Department of Environmental Quality oversees um, the monitoring of Arkansas waterways. And um, this data informs the efforts that we have in this state to improve and protect water quality. So um, through this monitoring, there were three watersheds uh, of interest to us that were identified as impaired. And um, from that came this uh, septic remediation pilot program um, that is happening in the Beaver Reservoir watershed, which is the one we administer, as well as currently happening in the Illinois River watershed. And then we're gonna talk a little bit later about the Buffalo River watershed, which we will be moving into. Um, this program is funded by the Arkansas Department of Agriculture's Natural Resource Division. Um, and we have a million dollars allocated uh, for the Beaver Reservoir watershed um, and now also the Buffalo River watershed to remediate systems. And there is an additional million dollars allocated um, in the Illinois River watershed. So first I wanna talk a little bit about uh, what a septic system is. It's very helpful to know how many people on this call have a septic. And I know from experience owning a septic that um, when I first became a septic owner, I didn't know a lot about septics. I had to learn. Um, so we want to give you a little bit of septic education about what it, what it is. Um, those were some of the questions we received also through the registration uh, for this webinar. So um, if you have other questions that we don't address now, there will be an opportunity at the end to address questions. So hang on to them. Um, so septic systems are uh, also known as on-site wastewater systems, treatment systems are basically a series of underground structures um, that route wastewater from the home um, into, and all of the drains in the home, into a septic tank, which I don't know if you guys can see my mouse, um, but this is the septic tank coming from the home, uh, into a distribution box, uh, which then routes um, water into the drain field or the leach field um, or the lateral field. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later, um, but. Um, from that lateral field, um, water, wastewater can diffuse through the soil and ultimately, as you can see in this diagram, uh, potentially enter, uh, re-enter the groundwater. Um, septics are very common in rural areas. The health department estimates as many as 40% of our Kansans are on septic, um, but they are uh, growing in urban and suburban areas like Northwest Arkansas, where our population and development is moving a little bit faster than our infrastructure. Um, so uh, it's becoming more common to see septics in all types of areas that are outside the reach of municipal services. Um, septic systems can be simple uh, or advanced. The image that we're looking at here is a simple system. Uh, it's a simple gravity system. There are no mechanized parts in this um, septic system. Uh, water is essentially moved through the system by um, the pull of gravity. There are advanced systems, which are um, you know, quite uh, more complicated. Um, and the type of system that a uh, home might have is determined by um, ultimately by the health department uh, where all septic systems are permitted. Um, but the type of system is dependent on the size of the property and the size of the home and the soil type and the layout of the property and these types of things, which is why they're permitted through the health department. So, um, and uh, regardless of what type of septic system uh, is with a home, 
all septic systems require maintenance. That's something I really want to convey in this in this presentation is that maintenance of a septic system is very important um, for a number of reasons that, that we'll talk about. So um, a little bit closer look at a septic tank. Uh, this is the inside of a concrete, what appears to be a concrete tank. Um, tanks today often are made of concrete or fiberglass or plastic. Uh, back in the 1960s or 70s, it was possible that a metal tank was used, which um, did not age well. We will see some images of metal tanks uh, later on in the presentation of some projects that we've been working on. But um, essentially, the tank receives wastewater from the home. So you can see my home icon up in the top left of the screen. So water is going to move through from all of the drains in the home. Um, the sinks, the toilets, the shower, the dishwasher, the washing machine, all of that's going to be routed down into um, the septic tank. It's going to come in and essentially be separated into three layers. The top layer is um, the scum layer, which is where things that will float stay like fats and greases and oils. The bottom layer is the sludge layer, which is where solids will um, settle out. And the layer in between is the effluent, which is untreated wastewater. So um, the effluent is going to move from one chamber to the next of the tank, and then ideally through the um, outlet and into what is commonly called a D box or a distribution box. Um, and from that, it will be routed to um, lateral lines, which are the drain field or the lateral field. Let's move the out of the way. Um, so uh, the untreated wastewater will move into the D box and then be routed out through the lateral lines. Lateral lines are usually perforated PVC embedded in gravel um, that the wastewater can slowly move out through and then um, the water will move into the soil uh, where it is naturally decontaminated. Um, so Um, so, like I said before, septic maintenance is very important. Um, regular maintenance is generally inexpensive. Uh, if uh, done regularly, you can expect to spend between $350 and $500 every three to five years um, having a septic tank pumped out, um, which is very inexpensive compared to the cost of replacing a tank or replacing an entire system. Um, we do see well-maintained systems last up to 40 years. Um, we are encountering homeowners frequently in our program who have been, who have the original septic that was built with their home in the 60s or 70s. Um, although we have seen that um, poorly maintained septics can fail even inside of 20 years or sooner. So um, in, you know, most cost-effective um, thing here as a septic owner is to maintain your system so that it will last as long as possible. Um, and septic failures are um, not just expensive to correct, but also pose risks um, to human health and to the environment. Um, they can contaminate surface waters, uh, they can contaminate wells, can contaminate groundwater. So, um, you know, maintaining a septic isn't just the um, most cost effective thing to do for the system, but it's also the most environmentally sound. Um, and, and a challenge we have specifically in Arkansas is the lack of regulation around um, septic maintenance and inspections um, for conventional systems, which are the most common systems that uh, most homeowners have. Um, there is some regulation uh, around uh, maintenance on advanced systems. Um, but, you know, say, for example, in a neighboring county in Missouri, um, it, is, it is required that septics are inspected. Uh, when a property is sold. And in Arkansas, we don't, outside of a few areas in um, a few counties, we don't really have any regulation around the inspection of septic. So something that we're finding that is definitely a challenge um, is that especially as more people move to this area, they're purchasing homes with a septic um, that is not being inspected that they don't know anything about. And oftentimes they're inheriting a problem with that septic. Um, so I think that, um, the need for regulation is something that hopefully will be addressed at some point. So um, what I'm going to show you in the next mini slides are examples of failures uh, that um, ways that septics can fail and what it looks like. This picture on the left um, is an example of what I mentioned earlier with a metal tank. So this is a collapsed septic tank. This is a um, homeowner that we're working with in Madison County. 
um, outside of Huntsville. So they have a metal tank that corroded and um, essentially just rusted away. And they have put um, a piece of plywood over the top of it, which has been there so long, it is also beginning to rot. So not only, and what we're looking at, um, you can see my mouse, what we're looking at in here is the opening of the septic and that is wastewater um, coming straight out of the house. This is the remnants of a, a main line from the house. And so when they flush a toilet or, or run a sink, you can actually see water coming out of this pipe into the tank. Um, so not only does this pose a you know, potential health hazard, but also um, if they keep this covered, but in the event that something happened and this cover was moved, we have an exposed hole. Um, that you know a um, person or an animal could accidentally wander into, and um, not luckily not in in our area recently, but there have been stories in the news in, in the last year or so of horrible horrible outcomes from people falling uh, people or children falling into septic tanks um, and drowning. So this is um, this is dangerous on so many levels. The picture on the right is um, also a homeowner that we have worked with that you will learn more about later. Um, there, this property is in Lowell. Um, this tank is also has also caved in. This was a concrete tank, and um, the this homeowner uh, was having the tank pumped pretty regularly, um, which is why there's not a lot of wastewater filling up and overflowing from where this is this tank has collapsed. But what we're looking at there, the sludge is is um, waste surfacing. Um, other examples of collapsed tanks, the this picture on the left um, is a home that uh, there was a single elderly woman living in who was still using all of the water in the home and so um, the tank had collapsed. There was also a break in the line from the house to the tank and so every time she used water inside the house it was essentially running right out into the ground. Some of it might have made it into the tank and then it was bubbling to the surface. Um, and then the picture on the right is um, also a cracked tank and a um, disintegrated distribution box. So wastewater wasn't able to move out of the tank and into the box. So it was surfacing on the ground above. Um, something that we have certainly learned uh, in our work is that wastewater will make its way to the surface um, if it's not moving all the way through a septic system. It will certainly make its way to the surface. And sometimes that will happen um, over the system components, like what you're seeing in both of these pictures, but we have lots of examples of where it surfaces down the street in the neighbor's yard. Um, so, you know, we, what we are definitely learning is that it will find its way to the surface one way or another. Um, this is also another example of a collapsed tank. Uh, this is a family in um, Avoca. In the picture on the right, what we're looking at is uh, right over the tank where the tank has collapsed. And so every time they, the family used plumbing inside the house, um, it was, you could watch it gurgle to the surface here. Um, and it had been like this for a very long time. This family had four children and they weren't able to use their backyard because it was essentially contaminated. Um, and so uh, because this tank was cracked, um, and not really able to receive wastewater. The other thing that was happening was this um, stub out, every time they, the picture on the left, every time they were using uh, any water inside the house, it would overflow and, and come out of this as well as falling from plumbing um, that was up here above it. So we really had quite a, an environmental mess going on here um, where the expense of correcting this was prohibitive. So the family lived with this for a very long time. Um, the parents were taking showers at a nearby gym that they had joined just so that they could take showers there to try to reduce the amount of wastewater that they were generating in their home. Um, and, you know, very tragically, they had four young children that weren't able to go anywhere near the backyard um, because it was just unsafe and because the smell was really, really bad. So um, this was a, a system that we were able to correct. Um, uh, failures can also happen in lateral lines. Um, the uh, this is a this picture that the health department shared with us, um, aerial view of a subdivision in Lowell, where you can clearly see the lateral lines uh, in, in the backyard of these homes. Um, and generally you should not be able to see the lateral lines, but what you can see here is what amounts to very well watered and fertilized grass growing. 
um, right over where the lines are, but not really else in the rest of the yard. So what that tells us is that water was not able to move through the lines and into the soil as it was designed to. And this, there could be a number of reasons for this problem. Um, but uh, we do see a number of program, a number of homeowners that come to us with failed lateral lines. Um, so that is something that we're able to help correct. Um, we also have seen, um, we, we're considering this a failure, although it's really um, uh, inadequately designed septic from the beginning. These are gray water lines. Uh, these are not on the same house. These are two separate houses. The picture on the right is a gray water line um, coming from the washing machine. The picture on the left is coming from a dishwasher where um, for whatever reason, the homeowner didn't want to tie this into the septic system, usually because they don't want to overwhelm the septic system, which tells us the system is probably not quite big enough to serve the needs of the household. Um, so what is basically happening here is the gray water is uh, being run out to daylight. Um, so this is not uh, in agreement with health department regulations. This all gray water has to be tied into the septic. Um, and this is an example, we're calling it a fail on the slide, but this is an exactly a failure of a septic system as it was designed. This was a failure to have a septic system designed to begin with. So uh, we're calling this a straight pipe system, um, also sometimes known as an old farmer's septic. Um, but essentially what has happened here, this is a home about a mile from Beaver Lake. Uh, the home, you can see it in the picture on the right, um, is up on a hill. We're standing downhill from it. The main plumbing lines running out of the house are just going into a pit in the ground, underground. Um, but there is no septic tank. There are no lateral lines. So um, wastewater is just going directly into a pit in the ground. And then it is basically accumulating here in a low spot um, downhill from the home. And so what we're looking at is a cesspool. Um, this is a system that we're able to correct for um, and help this homeowner install a proper permitted septic system that's appropriate for the land um, and the size of the home. And then this is a this is another picture that the health department shared with us. Um, the title on it was effluent or spring question mark. Um, and so you can see my house uh, icon up here in the right corner. This is a house on a bluff uh, that um, did not have, it had a septic tank, but no lateral lines. So wastewater was leaving the home um, and going essentially into the ground in the bluff and then dripping its way out, um, looking suspiciously similar to an underground spring, but in fact was untreated wastewater dripping out. So um, this is not a project that we're working on, but this is something that we could correct for that does occasionally, we do occasionally see examples of this. Um, so uh, now that you understand how septics work um, and the ways that septic systems can fail, enter our program. Um, because with our program, we can help address these problems. So um, in order to participate in our uh, program, our assistance program, a homeowner just must apply with us. We have an online application. Um, and uh, immediately as we're receiving an application, we'll begin working with the health department in the county that the homeowner lives in. Um, to require to get the required sign off that we need from the health department. Um, the homeowner once approved for our program will hire a designated representative, which is uh, a septic designer licensed through the health department to design septics uh, in accordance with all of the health department's regulations. Um, so that the septic designer will design either a new system or a repair for the failing system if a repair is possible. I will say that almost all of the projects we have done have been replacements. So we put in new systems um, where it, the repair that was needed was too big. It just made better sense to put a new system in. So this designated representative will design a system, um, submit that design to the health department for approval. And uh, once they receive approval, um, the homeowner will solicit three bids from licensed installers. Um, to uh, for the cost of the installation of the system. Um, once uh, the homeowner is allowed to um, select the bid and the installer that they want to go with, we do prefer that homeowners select the lowest price bid, but we leave that decision up to the homeowner. Um, there may be reasons why they want to go with a bid that wasn't necessarily the least expensive. We do find in our bidding process that most of the time bids are quite competitive. 
Um, and then we give the homeowner the stamp of approval to hire the installer and have the system installed. Um, and uh, our program works on reimbursement. So once the system has been installed, we can submit to our funder, the Natural Resource Division, um, for reimbursement, which can take between three to six weeks. We're really proud um, and, and very happy with um, ANRD that the timing on that is much, usually much less. So a lot of times we're able to turn around a reimbursement in three to four weeks. Um, and then we reimburse the homeowner. So um, the funds that we disperse to the homeowner uh, can be a combination of grant and loan funds um, that help pay for the septic installation. Uh, the percent of grant and the percent of loan is determined by household income, which you can see in this chart. Um, so for example, let's say a homeowner um, makes $14,000 a year in taxable income. Um, they would then qualify for a 90% grant in our program. So then let's say, for example, that it costs $13,000 to have a new septic designed and installed. This homeowner would receive $11,700 as a grant and $1,300 as a loan from our organization. Um, the homeowner would then only be responsible for paying back the loan portion, which was $1,300. And they could do that, for example, say in a $50 a month payment for up to 16 months. We're able to be quite flexible in how we arrange payments with homeowners, um, which is very helpful. We find that the majority of our projects do fall into that 90% grant range so far. Um, and so being able to create a monthly payment that will work with their budgets has been very important. Um, the maximum amount that we can distribute to any homeowner for a septic remediation is $30,000 and the maximum uh, loan term is 10 years, but all of our loans um, are always at zero interest. So um, that makes a huge difference uh, for homeowners who otherwise would have to go to um, a bank maybe to get a loan. So the conditions of the accepting a loan, um, so a homeowner can accept both the grant amounts and the loan amounts from our organization, or they can choose to only accept the grant amount. Um, so uh, the decision is entirely up to the homeowner um, how they, how they wanna do that. If they do accept the loan amount from us, we secure that amount by placing a mortgage on the property for only that amount. So in the previous example, we would have placed a mortgage on the property for $1,300. Um, this mortgage is filed in the county clerk's office where the homeowner resides. Um, and then once all the loan payments have been made, so in that previous example, you know, $50 a month for 16 months, um, once that was paid in full, we would file a release of mortgage so that um, saying that our debt is paid and there's no reason to continue to secure that amount. Um, holding a mortgage on the property only ensures that the property can't be transferred to a new owner without the, the loan being paid. Um, but the mortgage also does not hold up the sale of a property. It can be paid in the transaction of the sale of the property or a refinance, which we have we have seen with homeowners. Um, so why does our program offer both grant and loan funds? Uh, grant funds, because uh, it's important that um, money not be the reason that we are negatively impacting water quality. If we can um, help homeowners address that and not let money be the obstacle, then that's a win for everyone in the environment and our water resources. Um, and also loan funds, um, because uh, as those loan funds are repaid to our organization, we will then have um, that seed money to fund future remediations beyond the period of our grant program. Um, so the idea is that we will be able to continue to remediate failing septics for a very long time, well beyond the period of this program. So now I have a couple of examples of projects that we have um, uh, completed. Um, so this first one is a family in Lowell. You saw the picture in the upper right-hand corner previously, there was the tank was collapsed. Um, so this was a, an elderly couple who had custody of and was raising their three grandchildren on fixed income. They only were receiving social security. Um, they had known that their septic was failing for, you know, somewhere up to 10 years, but had been saving money to get it replaced. Um, and it was taking them a very long time to save that much money. The tank had collapsed. So we had wastewater surfacing. 
Um, and the reason that in this picture, you only really see wastewater over this opening of the tank is because the family was having it pumped three to four times a year um, to keep the wastewater from spilling over into the yard. Um, so that in itself was a huge expense um, for them. So this family qualified for a 90% grant. The total cost of the design and installation of this new system, which you can see the new tank in this picture uh, on the left, upper left, and um, lateral lines going in in this lower picture on the right. Um, I mean, the lower picture, the picture on the bottom. So the total cost was $11,580. The grant amount of that, which was 90%, was $10,422. So the homeowners uh, took the remaining amount, $1,158, as a zero interest loan with our organization. Um, and so something interesting about this project was that the uh, original parcel that the house and, and the original failing septic were on were not big enough for an alternate. There was no alternate location to put the new septic. Um, luckily, the homeowner owned an adjacent parcel of land. So um, the lateral lines were able to be put on his other on his other property. But that's part of um, what drove up a little bit of the cost on this project was having to run um, you know, 75 to 100 feet of uh, line to get to the other property where they could put the lines. Um, so uh, that is a challenge as we remediate projects. We're finding sometimes there's not always a suitable alternate location. That was also a question that came in from one of the registrants um, in this webinar. And um, if, if there is no suitable, I will say this, the health department is um, quite resourceful in finding solutions. Uh, if we have run into situations where there is not um, a suitable alternative plot for a new septic to go in. And so there are, there are ways that the health department can um, work with what is there to, to find a way to put in a new septic or fix what is um, failing about the septic. So there's not, there's not a um, one size fits all answer to that question. <laughs> We've seen a number of different solutions to that. So if um, whoever it was that asked that question, if you have a very specific question about that in mind, you're welcome to reach out to me and I can tell you a little bit more about what's happened with some projects. Um, this project uh, is another project that we recently completed in Elkins. Um, this was a family with six children. They lived on 10 acres. Um, the septics in Arkansas have been permitted since the 70s um, and there was a time when there was a 10 acre exemption uh, where if the, if the landowner had more than 10 acres, the septic permit was not required. So that exemption has since been repealed, but this septic was installed when the exemption existed. So the system was not um, permitted. And as it turns out, the way it was designed and installed was inadequate for the size of the home and the number of people that were living there. Um, so they had many problems with it. Uh, ultimately the tank cracked. What you can see in the upper right-hand picture is um, where the tank has cracked and the lines, the main line connecting the house to the tank has been disconnected. So what you're looking at there is raw waste, um, just basically going into the ground. Um, they also had insufficient length of lateral lines. So um, it was just, oh, the system was always overburdened and I don't, you can't see very well in this picture, but the bottom right picture beyond the lateral lines, this is a pond that is on the property. So um, huge potential there to contaminate um, a, a, the pond, the water source. Um, so these homeowners unfortunately fell outside of our grant um, income limits, but they did qualify for a 100% loan with us, a zero interest loan. So the cost of design and installation of the system was just over $12,000. Um, what would work with their budget was a very low monthly payment. Um, so they stretched their payment out the maximum amount of 10 years. So they're paying $102 a month. And um, had they had to go to a bank right now when interest rates are between six and 7% on loans, um, it, it would have cost them almost an additional $5,000 in interest to have the system installed. So um, that was prohibitive to them. The monthly payment was more than their budget could afford. And so with our program, we were able to help them remediate the situation at a lower cost. Um, so now that you know something about septics and what we've been able to do, um, if you find that you need our program, or if you're a septic owner, first I would say um, be watching for signs of failure. Uh, slow gurgling drains back up into your house. Um, 
uh, wetness around components, so the septic components in your yard, um, wetness that is worse in periods of rain um, that may or may not have an odor. Sometimes it's a little bit better when the weather's drier. Um, can all be signs of a septic failure. So if you see any of these things, you probably want to consult with a um, septic professional to have your system evaluated. Um, if you find that your system is in failure you and you live in the Beaver Reservoir watershed, which I've included a link to here for um, a, a website where you can input your address and it will tell you your watershed, but um, the map on the right is um, the very large area that the Beaver Reservoir watershed includes. Um, so if you find that you live in this watershed, you can contact our organization and we can help. Um, let's see. Um, so now I'm going to address a few of the frequently asked questions. Some of these did come up um, in with uh, webinar registrants, some are questions that we just hear frequently. Um, a lot of people ask, are septic system additives necessary? Um, we speak with a lot of homeowners who add Ridex to their septics every single month. And um, the general consensus among septic professionals and the health department is that um, septic additives are not necessary unless you've been specifically instructed by a septic professional to use one. Um, this is a great resource. The link here is a great resource, uh, Kansas State University resource that talks about what septic additives are and, um, and why they might need to be used. But in general, um, we would recommend not using any septic additives unless you have been specifically instructed to do so by a septic professional. Um, uh, they say that if you're using them and you don't need them, you are just wasting money right down the drain. So we don't want anybody to do that. Um, we do have people ask a lot uh, about uh, who picks the bid for the installer that's going to install the system for homeowners working in our program and the homeowner gets to select that bid. Um, we do uh, help connect homeowners with installers, um, the resources to find installers, uh, and um, we uh, can help home, homeowners navigate the questions that they have making the decision about which uh, installer to go with, but we leave that decision ultimately up to the homeowner. Um, and we do have people ask, can anybody install my new system, including me as a homeowner? Uh, and the answer is no, anybody cannot, only licensed installers uh, through the installers that are licensed through the Arkansas Department of Health can install septic systems uh, in our program. Um, we hear this a lot. Also, I've lived in my house 20 years. I've never had my tank pumped. Um, everything seems to be working fine. Is this a problem? And um, my answer is it can be. Uh, it's septic problems are generally not a problem until they're a problem. And um, so if you have lived in your house for any period of time, more than maybe five years, three to five years or 10 years, and you've never had the tank pumped, you want to have a, your tank pump as soon as possible. If you recently purchased your home and a septic inspection was not part of your home purchase, I would recommend having the septic inspected. Um, it's nice to just, uh, it's good to see these issues coming. It um, can be very expensive and overwhelming to be blindsided by a septic failure. So um, having it inspected and understanding if there's a problem that may not be terrible right now and something that you can address soon, but um, it's, it's nice to be aware of these things and not have them sort of come up as a major failure out of the blue that um, also renders you unable to use the water in your home. So we want to help people avoid that. And um, an inspection could cost about $150. Um, it's well worth it when you consider that you can head off much bigger repairs uh, ahead of time. Um, we do get uh, sometimes in order to put a septic in, and especially on an existing piece of property, uh, it's possible that trees will have to come down or other ways to prepare the land. And the question has been, will our program cover that? And um, our program will cover anything that the septic designer included as necessary in their design. So um, this is something that uh, will be between the septic designer and the health department to decide, but our program will cover whatever is required to get um, the new septic in and operational. Um, we also in our program only can work with homeowners um, and uh, individual septic systems. We cannot do work with businesses, with management companies, with cooperatives, with community systems. Um, so we are only, only working directly with homeowners. Just the next few slides I'm going to run through very quickly some septic education. Um, the EPA is an incredible resource for this. Um, we already talked about this one a little bit, but definitely have your septic inspected. It's better to know 
um, than not know what uh, is going on. And um, they can generally tell you uh, the state of your system. And if you if they see problems on the horizon, they a lot of the time septic inspectors can see that coming. So it's nice to have warning on that. Um, Probably the most important tip, if not one of the two most important tips about how to maintain your septic is to have it pumped every three to five years. Um, you can expect to spend $350 to $500 every three to five years, but having your tank pumped regularly will head off lots of problems. Um, so in a similar way to having your furnace serviced and your air conditioning units um, cleaned seasonally, you want to have your septic pumped every three to five years. If you're a single person in the household, um, you probably can stretch out a little bit longer than five years, but I've not heard um, recommendations beyond 10 years. So if you have been living in your house more than 10 years and the septic has never been pumped, you probably wanna do that as soon as possible. Um, the EPA says don't strain your drain. Um, be aware of the water you are introducing, the amount of water you're introducing into your septic system. So this doesn't just apply to leaking faucets and fixtures, um, which can, you know, introduce unnecessary water over time, which can burden the system, but also being mindful of um, how you're using water in your household. So um, if you're, you know, trying to stretch out the length of your septic, then probably taking a shower and doing dishes and um, running the washing machine all at the same time is not a great idea because all that water is going to be introduced into the system at once. So spacing out these things that demand um, water use in your home is very smart so that it gives the tank a chance to receive it and push it out through the distribution box and lateral lines instead of overwhelming the tank at once, which is a great way to um, break connections in the tank and lines and other things in the septic system. Um, the EPA also says, think at the sink, be mindful of what goes down your drains. Um, you never wanna put fats, greases, or oils uh, into your septic system. Um, you also want to avoid using harsh chemicals, uh, paints, things like that should never go down your drain. Um, you, be mindful that some digestion does happen inside the septic tank. So uh, introducing toxic substances can really be disruptive to that. Um, but fats and greases and oils also can really in, uh, enlarge this um, scum layer on top, which can, you know, you don't want scum getting pushed out into the distribution box and then out into your lateral lines. That's a great way to clog lines. So um, limiting what goes down the drain to begin with and then having your tank pumped regularly will help uh, avoid that problem. Um, this, these tips about uh, what is flushable and not flushable, what should go down the toilet and what should not is as, as important as having the system pumped when it comes to maintenance. Um, basically, the toilet is not a trash can, and just because something is flushable, just because something can be flushed doesn't mean it should be flushed, um, and we have seen a tremendous amount of septic problems resulting from flushable wipes, um, which are not intended to go inside of a septic tank. Um, we have seen very expensive failures resulting from a tank full of flushable wipes and cleaning wipes and hygiene products, even diapers. Um, cat litter definitely does not need to go down the toilet. So the only things that should be flushed down the toilet are human waste and toilet paper. Um, so uh, if you have been flushing things that shouldn't have been flushed, the best solution to that right now is to get your tank pumped. Um, so uh, also the last tip that I'll give you is that you want to protect your drain field or your leach field, which is where your lateral lines are. Um, they can be crushed. And so as a general rule, you don't wanna drive over them. You don't wanna park heavy equipment or machinery on them. Um, this includes big tractors, RVs, boats, airplanes. You want to uh, not put a shed on top of any of the components of your septic system or a mobile home, which we have seen. Um, that doesn't ever go well for the septic system. You also wanna be mindful of what you're planting in your, in your drain field. Um, Things with shallow roots are generally fine, uh, but that will also depend on how deep your lines are buried. Um, so you wanna talk with a septic professional about that, but um, trees are generally not a good idea because deep roots that can grow into lateral lines or even the tank and those components, it can really wreak havoc. Um, so uh, protect your drain field. Um, so in addition to our program, uh, beginning last year, there is a, 
similar same program happening in the Illinois River watershed, um, which covers parts of Benton, Washington, and a little bit of Crawford County. So uh, the Illinois River Watershed Partnership is administering this program. They have a million dollars allocated to septic remediation um, just in these highlighted areas that you can see on the maps. So if you have a septic um, and you live in that area, you'd wanna contact the program manager, um, Morgan Keeling, who I believe is on this call. So if there are questions um, for that specifically, maybe Morgan can jump in later and answer them. The time period for that program is the same as hours, which is started in 2021 and will go through the end of 2023. And then we're very excited to announce that in September, we are expanding our program into the Buffalo region, um, which you can see on the maps. Uh, this will be administered by H2 Ozarks. We have a new staff person coming on board to help with this program in September. Um, and the, the period for this, uh, there is a typo on my slide. It is 2022 to 2024. Um, so if you live in the Buffalo region or you know someone that lives in the Buffalo region and you have issues with your septic, please reach out to us. We'll be very excited to, to help you with that. Um, so uh, this is a little bit of our call to action. Um, what can you do? Um, we want you to help us spread the word about our program. Um, we, if you are a member of an HOA or a POA, we would love to come and present the program and answer questions. Um, we have given presentations to realtor groups in the past, and that has been very, very helpful. Um, so if you are a realtor or you are friendly with a realtor group, um, we would love to come and speak with you all about our program. We have um, septic education materials that we can provide to homeowners and other organizations to provide to homeowners. So if you um, find a need for helping hand out tips about how to maintain your septic and things to watch for, we would love to get you some of that material. Um, and then especially as we're moving into the Buffalo region, we're very interested in working with other organizations, uh, environmental organizations, watershed organizations, and uh, those doing work in water quality um, to help better outreach our programs. So um, get in touch with us. We are very interested in making new friends. Um, so uh, again, we are we are so excited about this program and so grateful for the funding from the Natural Resource Division. And um, if there are any questions, I can take those now. I have a question for you, Shelley. This is Fred Huddleston. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, what about a septic system that has not failed yet, but has the potential of it? For example, uh, a metal tank installed early 70s or mid 70s. Uh, near a water, near a river or a lake, um, that we don't want to wait until it's failed. Do, would someone like that have uh, be a candidate for this program? Quite possibly. Um, we definitely should talk about that. Uh, there are um, criteria are that the system either has to be failing or otherwise in need of repair. Um, and so something certainly we're gonna run into as we move into the Buffalo region is septic systems that are too close to water bodies that need to be moved. So um, we also do often run into systems that are about 40 years old that might not be failing at this moment, but will fail any moment. So um, we, we just need to talk about that a little bit more specifically about it, but um, please feel free to reach out to me. Okay, that. we'll do. We can discuss, Thank you. yep. Shelly, there's a few questions in the chat um, here if you want to look, take a look at those. Yes, the manager for the Buffalo program is coming on um, in early September, the first week of September. Um, we're going to be working pretty closely together. So if you uh, need something before then, you are welcome to reach out to me. Uh, that coordinator and I will be um, to some degree working. Oh, there, will, there will probably be a lot of overlap between the two of us. So. Um, but first week of September is when uh, they're coming on board and then we expect to um, begin launching very quickly thereafter. Also see who can make it a law to ensure that septic systems are inspected when a house is being sold? Well, that is a great question. Um, there are a lot of entities that are interested in this uh, and I am not really well versed on the details, but at one point Benton County did try to pass an ordinance um, and it and it did not, I don't, I don't believe it made it through the quorum court. So um, this is something we definitely are hoping that the data from our program demonstrates a need for, and especially 
um, you know, just as I'm talking with homeowners, new homeowners that are moving to the area, and we have so many people moving to the area right now. Um, I probably at least once a week or every two weeks talk with a homeowner who just bought the house, had no idea that they had a septic or what a septic even was, and now the septic is failing. And so, um, you know, that there's a huge expense that new homeowners are not necessarily anticipating. And I've talked to some very scared and upset uh, homeowners who were like, what am I going to do? So, um, you know, we're hoping that we're hoping that our program can inform uh, and uh, we will probably be looking for people who are helping, who are interested in helping us create that policy. So um, you should definitely reach out to our organization. We do have a staff person whose um, specific work and interest is in policy. So reach out to us and I will connect you with her. Um, where is a list of companies who do tank cleaning? So uh, the health department maintains that database and I can send you a link to that or you can find it actually, um, we might be able to, I don't know if I can find it fast enough to drop it in the chat, but um, on the Arkansas Department of Health's website, if you navigate to on-site wastewater, um, there is, a, it's a long page of links and in there is a link to um, a directory of designated representatives, which are septic designers and septic installers, as well as septic pumpers. All of those professionals hold licensing through the health department. So the health department maintains that database. So um, I do see a lot of people go just to social media groups, their town pages and ask who would you recommend to pump out a septic tank? Um, so I think that's a great way to find referrals, but um, also that database on the health department's website is gonna be the most comprehensive. You can search by your zip code, distance to your zip, from your zip code there. Um, and if you can't find it or you need more help, reach out to me and I can, I can send you the link for that. Um, that's one of the reasons I will say, Dylan, adding um, onto your comment here about realtors can be more knowledgeable on how many bedrooms the house is supposed to have according to ADH approval. That is true. Something that we do see slip through the cracks um, with septic permits is when people make upgrades to their home and add bedrooms that the septic permit doesn't always get reevaluated and updated. So, you know, maybe originally the system performed well for the size of the house, but then they've added to it and now it's overwhelmed. The system is overwhelmed. Um, but we have really had great luck connecting with realtors um, because just my own experience, the first time I bought a house with a septic, I didn't know anything about it. Um, I had a fantastic realtor who said, you need to have a septic inspection. And I did not know that a septic inspection was separate from a home inspection. A home inspector does not install the, uh, inspect the septic. That's completely outside the realm of, of what they do. So it came down for me um, to having a great realtor who said, you need to have a septic inspector. And when they come here to do the inspection, meet them and have him teach you about what he's seeing. So that was my new home ownership and crash course in septics that I got um, very helpful. So that's definitely an approach we're trying here. Um, hey, in the <clears throat> Nate Wesson had a, his oh. hand raised for a question. Yeah, hi, Shelly. Uh, so I live in the Illinois River watershed and I have a house that was constructed in 1970. Uh, I know there is a septic tank out there, but the, the house is now hooked up to municipal water source. But uh, I don't know the status of that septic tank, whether it was abandoned properly or decommissioned properly, or if it poses a, a health and safety and environmental hazard. Is there a way I can determine that? You can check with the health department to see if they have any record. Uh, depending on when you were connected to municipal sewer, there may or may not be a record of anything that happened with the septic. Um, it should have been pumped out and crushed, depending on what the material was. <laughs> so um, a great way to find out, and it, I mean, it is not necessarily a free way uh, unless you want to do this yourself, but find the tank and open it and look. And has it been pumped out and filled with stone or is it still full of wastewater? But I would probably, if I were you, I'd probably start with um, the health department and see if they have any information. All right, thanks. Mm -hmm. There are more questions. In the rural areas, if there is not a septic system at all, will the program assist in installation of a system? Um, yes, 
uh, like the straight pipe system that I showed you in the pictures, we are going to help those homeowner, that homeowner put a proper septic in on the property. Um, the limitation here is that it can't be uh, undeveloped land. It can't be new construction or like a new purchase. Um, so if someone has been living on the property for a while and are just becoming aware that there's not a septic, um, we can we can help address that. So Ellen, probably the best thing to do uh, if you have a specific property in mind is to reach out to me and let's talk about it. Um, and we'll see. Most of the time, yes, as long as it's not new construction, we can probably help. Oh, Allison West um, from the health department has dropped the link in chat for the um, uh, septic professional database. So if you're looking for that, it is there. Thank you, Allison. Um, Ellen, we have not, okay, so the question is, have you encountered rocky uh, areas uh, or karst areas where septic systems are not able to be installed? We have not with our program, but we are also dealing with homeowners who uh, already live on property and there is already some sort of septic. Um, so we are not dealing with homeowners that are trying to develop land that may not be suitable for septic. Um, but I will say that the health department has, has told us that they have an interest in getting an operational septic on property where anybody is already living, where there's already a failing system. So, um, you know, this is an example of where sometimes advanced systems come into play and are warranted, where if the land layout and soil type and amount of space is not uh, conducive to just having a conventional gravity system. There are options for advanced systems. However, they are more expensive to install and they require a, a, an increased level of regular maintenance. So it's um, can be cost prohibitive for some homeowners. And if you have any other questions specific about that, um, let me know. And yeah, I think we have time for maybe just one more question okay. and then we'll have to wrap up. This is all really great, so thank you. Well, I think that was it. Ellen said her questions were specifically to the Buffalo. Um, we, we should chat about that more. Um, my contact information is all here on this slide. You can also find me um, just through our website, h2ozarks.org. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Shelly and H2 Ozarks uh, for all the work you're doing to address septic issues in Northwest Arkansas and the Illinois River Watershed Partnership. Um, focusing over there. Um, this has just been very informative and uh, just so happy to have you. We also want to thank Beaver Water District for helping to um, um, sponsor the speaker series event. So thank you to them for this as well. Uh, this will be recorded. Somebody uh, asked that in the chat. So it will be um, posted on our YouTube channel. We usually get those up fairly quickly. So I just keep an eye on YouTube for that. Um, and then I'm just going to post a quick link here. So just to keep up with um, future events coming up, we do have um, some agricultural workshops, um, a friend raiser coming up in September. We're going to celebrate landowners and partners working together. Um, so I encourage you all to um, continue coming and supporting the Alliance. Um, just really appreciate everyone being here today. So again, thank you, Shelly. Wonderful presentation. So, Thanks. all right, well, we'll wrap up for today. I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of your week and um, please, yes, do reach out to Shelly or I with, for any um, other questions and thank you so much.